Hello and welcome into another Chi Time with me, Clara Apollo, your conscious living show here, coming from the, the hills of Don Head St Andrew at my dear friend Karani and Daryl's, my, my lovely New Zealand folk friends. And um, I love to speak to a whole range of different people that are really at the top of their game. And um, on this episode of Chi Time I have for you, a chap that is um, calling in from New Zealand, um, a world-class didgeridoo player and a multi instrumentalist and all-round sound guy. See what I did there? We have Sika here, so welcome to Chi Time, Sika. Hi Clara, hi everybody, it's good to be here. Yeah, it's good, <laughs> I like your partner, it was good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we did speak to each other like a couple of years ago now, um, I think I was in London at the time and I don't actually know where you were, but... Uh, I think I was running out of a tube station and you bumped into me, didn't you? That was <laughs> Something like that, because you do a lot of travels. But and we were um, so there was a, a great you know, tea time interview. If you want to go um, to that on the SoundCloud, uh, then you'll hear about a lot of about seekers' past past lives, past well in this. Um, yes, yeah, of hours of seekers' past lives. It's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about your, um, you know, how you, where you were born and where you live now yeah. and how you lived in a teepee for 10 years and how you got into playing the didgeridoo. So all that history, fascinating, yeah. stuff, really great, has got yeah. you where you are today. And in a way, I remember you saying that when you first started to play the didgeridoo, it was a very kind of sacred act and not many people were doing it. And you kind of, it just became you and you became it. Yeah. And now... Yeah. Yeah, now very much so. Yeah, I mean, who could have possibly thought that then it would lead to this? But uh, yeah, I'm, most days go by. I'm very grateful for the didgeridoo and what it's brought to me, and the breath and the whole experience of taking it out into the world. It's been a life-changing moment in my life. You know, that the didgeridoo coming to me it was incredible. Yeah, so, and it's a gift. And you know, when you sort of talk about or feel what am I meant to be doing in, in my life and it's like oh I'll sit down when you're a six-year-old child and think oh I want to be a didgeridoo player that's not really yeah. how that didn't works. come up in the careers options actually not no. really I you wanted you to go in the catering corp of the army actually <laughs> <laughs> I actually seriously entertained that for a while and kind of came to my senses and realized that that was a hopeless case really for someone who was end up like me my destiny was written on the wall at that moment. It was like, no way, don't let him go in the army. Like, that would be really bad. Like, they wanted make, to go, that, you know? Mate, you cut your hair and everything. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> but you did, in fact, um, get into photography and art. And we can see a piece of your recent art behind you here now. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, yeah. It's called yeah. Orb Breaking Free. And um, I've been painting orbs for over a year now and become quite obsessed, obsessed with them and the, the deep meaning of them. Like it, it started from a, a need to get back into really painting a lot and, uh, and not knowing what to paint and getting overwhelmed at the idea that I wanted to paint kind of everything in the world. But I obviously couldn't in the time that I have got and you know, blah, blah. But then one day I was, uh, I thought, okay, I've just got to start, I've just got to start. And I, so I decided to, paint a circle and then I was going to do a tree of life over the front of it like this and that night I just painted the circle and I I went to bed in the studio and and the spotlight was shining right on the painting and as I lay there I thought my god that's it you know there's the orb that's the molecule the atom the the tiniest minusculest microscopic nanoscopic thing with the whole world inside it the grain of sand and I just got the, the symbology of this amazing circle and became hooked on it. And now I've spent over a year painting them. And this one is the first one that's actually got these kind of roots and rhythm, ribbons and things that are coming along the edge of it. And they are, it's kind of like it's breaking free from the restraints of what it was, as in the Mother Earth is, you know. Wow. So you can easily see the, the uh, analogy to humanity upon the earth we're, we're breaking free we're finding how it is to be to be true and real with each other and all the truths are being exposed in the world and we're sort of squibbling and squirming around at the truth being exposed and it's going to find its place of 
balance you know but we're in this kind of moment of breaking free like this orb is you know yeah absolutely yeah. that was a wonderful explanation thank you for for sharing that and and that sense and feeling that as we are all breaking free within ourselves and it can be a bit uncomfortable as well but we're also supporting each other because we're all going through this oh, yes. transformation so, yeah i'm so with you there i mean every single one of us there's no no nobody's better or worse than anyone else we're all part of it so there, then we have a vested interest to reach out to everybody everyone in the street and everyone we don't know as if they are brothers and sisters because we are actually you know <laughs> Isn't that the truth? And I'm going to share something here with um, listeners and viewers in that I just recently introduced Seeker to Shane Locke on, from Soul Traveller. And, um, yeah. and the guys had a conversation between each other when I was asleep in bed and I was part of the, the, the whole thread of it. And it was just such an honour to be party to Soul Brothers talking to each other about real issues. So I thank you for sharing that with me even though it might have been in, in, inadvertent but the, the truth that was around because as a woman we, we're looking at women's issues and the divine feminine and all that sort of stuff and i had a yeah. window in a portal in to what you what the sort of issues that you guys speak about and it's really similar and it's like yeah it, it's not <laughs> man and it's woman probably really similar and really expressed in a different way in fact that reminds me of something that i heard yesterday that cracked me up there's hundreds of different ways that women can say no and, and a few of them mean yes <laughs> I thought, yeah brilliant i'm gonna ask you about some of your stories actually because i was chatting with claire cortell the other day too i'm obviously clearly name dropping on this show tonight but it's actually yeah, doing a good job, then. because we're talking about community here and holding each other's hands as we walk each other home so you know, yeah. people coming in that are um, um, important parts of our lives. And she was telling me that when you first came to Bournemouth, um, the, the first shows that you did, you were talking about you know, the stories, the Aboriginal stories, and, um, you know, mm -hmm. behind the, the sounds that you were making. And, and yeah. the power of story being so important for our transformation and our breaking free. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I... <sighs> I can't really emphasize that enough, actually. I think that the, the telling of the stories of our life to whoever, whoever it is that we're telling it to is it, so important for our health and well-being and, and in every way. And uh, the indigenous people that I have spent time with all understand that. They, they know that because they're still listening to their grandparents telling them stories about them and about the family and about the land. And so there's this continuity that is, yeah, we need to feed it more. Let's put it, put it really positively, you know. I was going to go down that road then of saying what we need to do, but it's actually we are doing it. We just need to keep feeding it, you know, feed that fire and show people by example what it is to actually communicate and tell your story. And what I take great joy in doing like one of the things that i really really love doing is going into a crowded city and telling my story to whoever it is that i interact with in the course of the day yeah, yeah. and i've had some amazing interactions with the public in that way you know whereby like um half a, a train carriage suddenly start engaging in a conversation together you know from being silent and locked into their world of ipods and phones and what have you suddenly ipods so i'm showing my age there but you know what i mean because that was when actually i was visualizing this experience in sydney yeah. city yes unbelievable well, another time on a bus and i and ended up having a, a, a kind of 15-way conversation up and down a bus and these are in in places like that that one in in a bus wasn't even in a crowded city that was uh, a somerset bus in in england it was a rural bus but it does it shows how close to wanting to communicate people really are and that when they're stuck in their eye locks you know yeah uh, that's just a distraction yeah. 
technique, yeah. isn't it? Really, because they all want absolutely. to absolutely. Actually, everybody's crying out for it. We're just starving for it. You know, when somebody cracks and pops the bubble and you know breaks into that little cocoon, suddenly everyone's like, ah, you know, I can breathe. Help hungry. me. I need to communicate with you. Yeah. You know. So how how would you start off these um, conversations on a bus or on a on a train? Like oh, it's you... pretty easy when you look like I do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Flick your hair around and go. Starting with a ninety-eight year old woman, it was like uh, <laughs> no, it's not a problem. So. <laughs> on the occasion, I think I was carrying a two and a half meter long bag or two meter long bag full of didgeridoos and a big drum and a backpack. So that you know. <clears throat> So people say, what's in your bag? Uh, no, it's usually when I tap on the side of it and ask them if they're all right in there that people start asking me things. <laughs> yeah, one of the things we were talking about before on that, that other um, um, SoundCloud interview was that, do you travel with your didgeridoos or do you have them all in different countries? And you said, all, you know, all of that, you travel with some and you have some in different countries. And, you know, right, yeah. It's very difficult to travel with the really long ones, but do you find that when you're in one country, you just really start missing some of your instruments and you kind of like, oh, I really miss the tone of that one. I can't wait to get back to it, you know? Funnily enough, I had this conversation just a few days ago with a musician and uh, I was saying that, in fact, I don't. And that's amazing because I do have a very intimate relationship with them. I do travel with three didgeridoos, so they're always with me. But when I get to the other end and I crack open Pandora's box and there is the new collection for the season, yeah. it's every time I get a rush, every time the stories of each instrument and how they came to me and where they've been played just kind of floods over me. And I'm just like, oh, yes, I'm ready now. You know, this is going to be an awesome tour. <laughs> And talking of which, Singer is coming to the about, UK and about doing an awesome <laughs> tour. <laughs> so you're you're right you're, you're, you're yeah so anyway should we go to a, um, a track let's do a track before we yeah, start talking about your awesome tour um which one do you fancy playing first uh i wouldn't mind playing uh, the uh, phil thornton um seven rings thing. so this is from your new album which is a collaboration with phil thornton who how did you get to work with him i, I gather you've got quite a history with this guy uh well what happened um phil and i have been kind of in this music world, the same part of the music world for a very long time, probably over 20 years for me and probably longer for him. And uh, it was a good friend of mine who recorded a very well-known album by Phil Thornton called Initiation, which was really one of the first uh, kind of pioneers in the, in the world of didgeridoo coming into, into Britain. I mean, there were other albums at the time as well, but that one really hit the scene big time. And uh, 25 years later, Phil put up a post on Facebook saying that it was 25 years since this album had been made. And uh, I, I just wrote to him and I said, well, then maybe it's time we did a, a follow up to it, you know, and I'll play the ditch for you this time. And he just jumped at it and said, yeah, let's do it. So we started working together and uh, it was immediately obvious that it's an incredibly easy and natural working relationship. So um, this time when I go back on tour, we have uh, two or three gigs together, one of which is booked at the moment. The other two aren't up on the website yet. And uh, we're also going to start recording a new album again, a second one. So what we're going to play now is off the first album that we recorded, which is called Seven Rings. And this is the title song.
We're here. Good. We're here. We're now. We're live. We're recording. We're Seeker is here. Everyone else, is everyone else there? <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening to this, you're live. Yes, absolutely. That was Seven Rings off the new album from Seeker and Phil Thornton. Um, of the album of the same name, Seven Rings, and um, full of didgeridoos and rhythms and playing. I mean, do you just sort of how do you work this with him? Because is he used, using um, uh, synthesizer <laughs> stuff or what? What's going on? How do you do it? Uh, yeah, it's amazing collaboration, but it's something that most well probably all of you know now that I've always been really obsessed by synthesizers and. Uh, and Phil is a synth player, you know, you know, he's an amazing, extraordinarily good top end synth player who's been in bands and um, in the rock scene and, you know, supported some pretty big bands and uh, and then went largely into the kind of new world music um, and kind of creating new age music and actually sold something like a million and a half albums in, the, in that genre. So he's uh, a very skilled, accomplished, sensitive synth player. And um, it, to me, just has always been a passion to actually find a way to merge that electronic world with the ancient wooden skin drum bone earth rock world, you know. And they totally weave together. It's just incredible in the studio there are sounds that one instrument makes that are just like they're emulating the sound of an electronic one. And when you put them together, those harmonic frequencies just do things, magical things, you know, they really do. So yeah, both of us found it extraordinarily rewarding and easy to work together. That's it. And that to you, synthesizers alongside native instruments like that, it's actually the people that are working with them that makes the sounds work. So, you know, it is that. Well, it is, you know, yeah. it's like you could say that about all our tools and things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you could say that. And, uh, and also, you know, there is uh, that unknown, unplannable. Um, out of control wildness that can happen when you put together those things and and those moments are often highlights you know when Phil and I will look at each other in the studio and we will just know that something very magic is happening and we're not particularly fully in control of it you know? <laughs> you know, that's when you know it's proper magic because exactly. it's not really that being in control it's riding it it's riding totally it. and that is life isn't it you know we're dancing this thing of like being aware and watching it and then just being fully in it and yes. somewhere in the ethers there in that gray area is this amazing magic yeah and if you manage to record some of that to share with us we're really grateful thank you you know Excellent. Well, hopefully we have <laughs> we'll have to all listen to it and let us know yeah <laughs> absolutely but there was another album that is reasonably new isn't it and that's the one with the the, the sound journey on it how, how did that come about and why did you get into well into uh, the first over 25 years ago probably yeah 27 28 years ago i did my first public performance and uh it turned out looking back that it was a sound journey and um, it was with a friend of mine who's called Mark Whiteford. And uh, he was um, practicing shamanism as well with a Scandinavian shaman. And so we wove that whole thing together, did a nearly three hour nonstop sound journey, uh, upon which we emerged from the far off distant worlds that we'd been to. And uh, I remember looking to Moose, that was his nickname. And I said, hey, maybe we should take a, a break and then do the second half. After three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was cool. It was really cool. And I didn't know. Now, like the idea of a sound journey in those days wasn't really like a recognized term like it is these days. Now we all kind of have, it's almost like a music genre, really. 
for those of us in the know, you know, that little secret club that we're in, yeah. which is not secret. But um, yeah, 25 years later, I decided, well, I really am good at taking people on a journey with these instruments, and I'm sure people are going to want that. So it's time to put it into an album. And it came out as one hour long, non-stop. So it's very deep and very enlightening, really. Mm. Mm. And do you ever, you know, put on the cans and, sit and listen to it for yourself? Or <laughs> too close to home? My own music? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest, Claire, Clara, I mean, the process of, of making those albums and the process then of putting them out into the world means that I listen to them enough. And if I want to listen to those instruments, I just play them. Okay. So I don't really sit and listen to the album once I've finished it. Maybe now and again I do, but not so much. There's, there's something about, you know, the music holds a space for us to go on a journey. And, you know, who holds the space for you to go on your journey? Ah. Oh, you're going to make me cry if you start talking about that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a good question, really, because there ain't many of us around. <laughs> but this um, summer here in, in Aotearoa, a friend of mine, Kailash Kokopelli, came over from Germany. Um, and we played at a festival together and we um, guested on each other's sets. And uh, that was very special. That was really special to be with somebody who is in the same genre and the same ilk. Yeah. Oh, so you were able to bask and absorb and be and not have yeah. to give it's the receiving that's so important for performance of course it is of course it is you know but and of course when i'm giving you know, i'm massively receiving as well so when i'm doing a sound journey or a concert it's an incredible experience for me as well like a, i am on a journey with it i'm receiving direct transmission and direct information for my journey yeah, it's part of it. <clears throat> it's like a, a bigger and expanded version. Or you're as you see, becoming a channel. I know it's very popular way of saying it, but I think we are all channels for the divine to come through us in the different ways of expressing on yeah. the earth. And it, yeah. you're, you, know, the, you found your way. As you say, you found your voice through the didgeridoo. You used to be quite an introverted chap. And yeah. uh, the didgeridoo brought you out of yourself. It showed you another aspect of yourself. It's like, this is your gift through the sounds coming through and then you know it, in the beginning was the was sound anyway so we know how yeah, it really how was like that yeah the vibration is um totally to get clear. interestingly actually the new album that i'm working on now the new sound journey album which i'll have uh, for the tour over in the uk um that has actually got quite a lot of my voice in it which i've known for a long time was the, what the journey was about really it went from you know me being the very quiet introspective to kind of gradually coming out as a painter and an artist and then gradually coming out as a musician and then a performer and a public figure and then suddenly you know without any of the the tools and the instruments there i am just with my voice that's the journey you know <laughs> Oh, I'm really interested to hear what you're going to, so what is what the sounds coming through, but also are you speaking or are you it's sounding or what is it? Oh, I'm yeah, but I'm not going to tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> going to have to wait and see, folks. <laughs> but it's lovely yeah. to watch, um, be party to your development, you know, to sort of see how you've been going through your own process and that it's continual. It's not about getting to a destination, is it? It's about being on this sound journey of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so very much really is. And I'm loving sharing it. I mean, uh, for me, there's such an incredible nourishment that comes from sharing it and doing it. You know, I really do, do enjoy that. And I'm enjoying even more the, the connections and the real honest sharings that are happening with everybody 
as a result of it because mm -hmm. it brings up so much for everyone and me included and and those tender moments are they're kind of like what it's all about really and and that has become so much more um, important and such a bigger part of my world yes you are what's a really common thing that people talk to you about what's one of the most significant areas that people share with you <clears throat> in these tender moments well that's a good question there's always the uh the mention of um spirit beings and ancestors mm -hmm. around coming to people yes. and that I think is a very moving experience to have when uh, I feel like when when that happens to me I'm just washed with gratitude because it means so much in this lifetime and uh, any any contact any knowing from that realm that we can have just helps us to become stronger and more balanced and to heal. Yeah. So those are, those are very mo moving moments when people um, share that. I feel really honored that they would share that with me. Yes. And to have acknowledged and recognized that that's something that you feel as well. It's something I feel it's something like a lot, a lot of our, our folk, yeah feel that that it's like we have the baton of life at the moment but we're here on behalf of our ancestors that stretch back for generations you know um, yeah. and but be, just because we're incarnated at the moment with the, the life force running through us we're kind of here on behalf of them so their yeah. that their support is there because they they are part of us you know not just genetically i think it's not always yeah. the genetics is it it's more this the sense of the the support from the other worlds that are absolutely yeah absolutely and it sometimes can feel like a, a a really fond reunion you know with with an aspect of our past you know it's yes. uh, yeah it's it's a powerful <laughs> thing you know it's, what i get from it is it is the profundity the 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 fun within that and the you know, I, I lost an aunt, my auntie like nearly a couple of years ago now, and for a long time I was very sad about that. And I, but yeah. she, he would connect with me, and she's a singer, she was an, an opera singer. And so that whole thing of my voice, my voice went a bit weird for, a, for a, about a year or so. And then when um, I had a dream about her and her lovely husband, my uncle John, and who was another opera singer, and, a, and it was a, such a strong, it was like a lucid dream, my son was there with me. And I got to the point where I was hugging her, and I could really feel her, and I, the emotion came up and she said to me, don't drop into that, You'll, we'll lose the connection. If you get sad about that, mm. that's, that's what stops the connection. So I, went, oh, so I kept with my heart connection with her, and now it's like the joy of, mm. oh my goodness, you know, we yeah, relationship totally. expanded and evolved and, you know, yeah. the, it's just the human emotions that feel the sadness, but the connection seems even bigger and broader. Now I'm, I'm not letting myself, or I, you know, I want to test yeah. the process, don't you? But that is that dance, isn't it? That's that beautiful dance of of connecting emotionally enough to feel something, but opening the heart enough to be able to Explore. connect from the heart. Yeah, to the whole yeah. broader sense of what is our um, connection with spirit, you know, and yeah. our past lives, future lives, or whatever, you know, this whole time dimension. Yeah, that absolutely, we and and the incredible speed that that sharing, that exchange with somebody can happen. Like, you know, going back to meeting somebody in the street or in a bus or a train or something, mm -hmm. and you know, there's that can be just an exchange of of an eye contact or something that is fleeting, that gives you like a download of lifetimes <laughs> it's like well i know you you know soul yeah. meat and it's the eyes a momentary you... opening of a of a window into yeah so <laughs> totally yeah. and also i love about our, our eyes don't age you know all the other bits kind of do what they're doing uh, but the, nice. when you get into the eye contact yeah 
yeah true live going all the way back Vroom, you know yeah. and that's the, and when you can do that to yourself in the mirror as well that's pretty freaky because you don't know which yeah. eyes are in yeah. Yeah. <laughs> are we on air now then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but look tell you what, we should go to a, well, a let's song. play the song <laughs> yeah let's play a song oh, a track should we do one of the ones from the the sound journey album then you We've got two that yeah, you go for it. Yeah. Which one would you like? The falling between the worlds or the cave beneath the tree of life? Oh, you choose. What do you intuit? Falling between the worlds. All right. That's what we were talking about. Absolutely. Back with you after this.
So you're back on Chi Time with me, Clara Apollo, and we have Sika here in the hot seat. Um, Hi there. <laughs> and you just heard the Falling Between the Worlds track that um, hopefully t helped taking you to special places within, unlike what we were just alluding to beforehand. So Sika takes his didgeridoo around the world although he has you know, various ones in different places. Um, though you're currently based in New Zealand, yeah? Yeah, I live in the uh, top of the South Island of New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. And it's a place called Golden Bay. Golden Bay. Wow. Yeah, it sounds very romantic, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it was a yeah. track about that. Um, but you also come over to the UK uh, and do, and you've got an extensive, I think we'll call it, your extensive tour occurring and you're <laughs> coming over in, in July. And I'm loving it because you're kicking off at Stonehenge. Yeah, what a way to go, eh? Oh, what a way to start a tour. I know, I am so fortunate, really am. So, so uh, is it like playing the didgeridoo at power sites like Stonehenge and... What's, what happens then? Um, it's, it is playing it inside an amplifier, really, but it's not like a, just a loudspeaker system. It's an amplifier on a, on a very deep and far out level. Uh, to me, I always feel like I'm playing in the hub of the grid, the earth grid, and, it, and it's just like sending these pulsations of sound down these earth grids around the planet and back to me you know so it's like encompassing the planet with sound vibration from the hub yeah that's what it's like around the, <laughs> the, the, the co corridors of sound power exactly yeah mm -hmm. without a doubt the song lines of the earth the energy centers the ley lines exactly without a doubt so yeah it's an exciting moment it's a short window of time that it's like a TARDIS of time. You know, you walk into that into that hinge, and suddenly your hour just becomes like very stretched out, and a lot can happen in a very short amount of time. So are you, you've you've only got one hour. What what time have you got then? What time of the day? From quarter to ten till no, hang on. Yeah, no, from quarter to nine until quarter to ten. Is that in the evening? Yeah, in the evening, yeah. So I'm guessing that will be sunset, won't it? Yes. Oh my God, I'm going to say that. <laughs> I'm going to be down at the, um, <laughs> at the, the hut again. And actually, what's happened is I've just been on retreat for the last two weeks and, um, you know, sort of coming back into mainstream and thinking, am I going to be able to string words together? But it's absolute joy speaking with you, Secret. It's really easy. So thank you for... Um, you seem to be blurring them quite well. It's quite good. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking... <laughs> I drive up from, from Plymouth to, to Stonehenge. I'm like, I think I could do that. So, yeah, yeah so that's where I you... I have to admit that even I'm checking into a hotel after that. <laughs> I'm not going to drive after that. <laughs> and you, 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 you sleep in a... We should hire a hotel together and we could all go and <laughs> tell each other stories until the early hours of the morning. <laughs> Yeah, because that's what happens. You get a, a community that come with you and then that you do something like that. And then to go off on your own again would just be weird. It's like you're right to sit around a fire telling stories or something would be absolutely. Let's see. Let's see what we that can do. Be, I know that, and Tracy Ash, if she's in the country, I think she would be right up for this as well. She does a lot of work at power sites at, around the world. Stonehenge is a big favourite. Well, you're actually going to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> The thing is, yeah, you know, things like this <laughs> get seeded. Who knows? What's to happen? I'm really okay. happy. To hold now on here now. Everyone will be there in the car park waiting. Where's the fire seeker? <laughs> All right. Well, what day is that on? She says, not even knowing where I died. Tell me to close everything Eight. on my. Oh, this is just the beginning of Seeker's tour, people. This is like kicking off. So <clears throat> it'd be a really nice way to start it all off, wouldn't it? It's a Saturday. It's yeah, it so do you have to buy tickets and stuff? Yeah, unfortunately, it's uh, it's it's governed and shall we even say policed by um, in English heritage, right. and uh, they will. they're allowing um, thirty people at a time. So it's a closed group, and as far as I know, everything is sold out. Woo! 
that's painful, isn't it? Having just done this great big long, exciting talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are we going to do now? All that us that stick our cars in the car, well, listening to if it. If it makes any difference, the next morning I shall be going to the World Yoga Festival and playing there and doing a sound journey. So, um, so it's a great start to your tour, isn't it? And you say you're going yeah. to. Um, yoga festivals you're going to Butterfields, you're going to see elaine fenton and all her crew up at healing healing weekend um, yeah. and the, the healing weekend was awesome last year it really was absolutely yeah. and and then you're going to dip down to to spain aren't you so you believe you're going to see your sister down there yeah that's right i'm going to go and see pixie yeah. she's my beautiful sister she's um living down in a small place in the hills of sierra nevada called orgiva and um has a little straw built house that she built down there and lives a, a very creative and earthy life. So I'm looking forward to going down there. Yeah, very much. And I have a sound journey there as well. Okay, so is this what I mean, you, are you mainly taking your sound journey around or are you doing performance and storytelling or what, or is it a mixture? Uh, or what, probably. Yeah, all right. Uh, no, no, <laughs> it's probably, um, I would say three quarters sound journeys um right. when i'm playing at festivals then i'm also doing performances mm. and uh, i'll be performing the more up-tempo music and i'm um, down in uh Khan glaze cavern for example yes uh, debbie walker is uh is promoting hosting a, a concert in the cave down there at Khan glaze cavern which i'm really excited about really am That's so that'll be a, a concert not a sound um, journey yeah yeah and then of course, so, yeah, it's a mixture. And then hang on, you're coming to Bournemouth. Seeker is oh, coming yeah. to Bournemouth. I'm Woo! coming to Bournemouth. Four Yay. events, of course. We've got of you course. all evening. Thank you so Couldn't much. Couldn't miss that. Yeah, yeah I'm really looking great. forward to it's that. Well. Really, yeah. Although I must say, every time I go to Bournemouth, I get thoroughly lost. But I think I'm meant to wander the streets of Bournemouth asking people where are these places that I'm trying to find? <laughs> well, we're, we're be, being hosted by the gorgeous Orchid Hotel. They're just like a lovely crew there and it's a beautiful yeah. room and they're really looking forward yeah. to it. So I think that's going to be a very special no, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that as well, very much so, right in the heart of the south of England. Yeah, but, in, but the hotel's just got such a lovely feeling to it. It's got Buddha statues around the place and orchids and things. That's it very kind of it's not your not your normal kind of Bournemouth hotel it's it's a very nice <laughs> ride um so you're going to suggest that people can come and lie down at that so that yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely that one's um what have they got on the floor there i think people probably need to bring a blanket or something to lie on yeah, yoga mat or something like that yoga mat or a blanket or both yeah yeah and uh, that'll be a deep inner journey that one yeah Brilliant. And will you tell us a, a little story as well? Will you, will you pepper some of it? Oh, for sure. I will. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I quite often like to listen to what the instruments are telling me to tell as well. And now I have quite a lot more instruments with new stories mm -hmm. that are, have been working their magic with me for in the last few months incredibly strongly and weaving things together that, that I'm very happy with the way it's going, actually. Yeah. Over here, the Māori word for these instruments is tong or pōro, which means the singing treasures. And they totally are singing treasures. So, yeah, I'm happy to share that. And that, that is now how my sound journeys are. Like there's nothing um, pre-recorded and electronic in the sound journeys. It's all just natural sounds. And they've become incredibly powerful. Like in the last year, people, healers and visionaries and uh, seers and channels have been to the sound journeys and have said that they can see a considerable step up in what's happening now and what I'm delivering. So I, I really feel that very strongly. Like I'm, I've stepped into my power with it now and they've changed. Oh, I can feel that. Um, that you, as you've been developing and letting that expression come through you, it's on behalf of humanity to for our next level. You know, is even if you've been to a seeker sound journey a couple of years ago, you come back and it'll be different. It'll be evolved, be more, as you say, finding those more treasures within through the, the, the sound and 
different levels and depths, you know, any shamanic journey is never the same. You never get the same experience twice. Yeah, exactly. And so rep repetition is, is really a key, you know, and with any journey. And that way we can slip inside those inner realms and find out what we need from wherever. And we can do that really effortlessly. And gradually the, the realms kind of merge together. It's, it's easy to bridge and smooth over the, the distance between them so that we're living between the two. We're straddling multi-dimensions. Yeah, exactly. That's the aim, really. So the more we do them, the better. Because then we're actually practicing it and practicing it and practicing it. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, we just get pulled back to 3D. I'll tell you what, should we play Cave Beneath the Tree of Life now? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Do that and we'll come back with Fika after this. Cool.
So coming out of the cave beneath the tree of life. Mm. 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 Wow. There's a story to that one, actually, yeah. which is uh, I was sitting beneath a yew tree in the centre of the Glastonbury Zodiac in Somerset in England. And uh, there in the centre of the Zodiac, there is actually a little yew forest. And there's one tree in particular in the middle that is a, a real grandmother tree. And so I was sitting there at the base of it on a journey. And I was with um, Arwen Dreamwalker, um, one of the grandmothers. And, uh, and I went into a trance and I saw beneath the roots of the tree, a cavern underneath the ground. And there was a river flowing through this cavern and paddling it down this river into this big cavern were four Aboriginal elders sitting in a canoe, in a spirit canoe. <laughs> and then what so that, that led to uh, the creation of this song. Oh, I see. And then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> this track. About uh, a few days later, um, a friend of mine gave me a gift out of the blue. I'd never seen it before, and he, there wasn't any reason to give me a gift. He just came and gave me a gift of a, um, an Inuit uh walrus tusk carving of a white canoe what is that yeah did you just like go oh. <laughs> yeah i did yeah it was like wow that's the spirit canoe yeah and that connection between the worlds it's like that story that you told us before about holding the owl feathers and you're holding one owl feather and then owl hooted you had two owl feathers and there were two owls and you had four in the end didn't you yeah 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 exactly it's oh, exactly it's all that. happening <laughs> you know yeah but so, that's so when i'm when i'm when i was recording this song this was what i was visualizing was that journey into the cavern there with the elders who've always been with me yes. and uh continue to be you know Yes. Yeah. And you, you're becoming an elder in the nicest possible way as well. I mean, you're a father, aren't you? I am a father, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have two beautiful children. Yeah. I have a daughter who's 18 and a son who lives with me who's 12, going to be 13 in, on tour, actually. He's coming with me on tour. He's coming on tour with you? Yeah. How yeah. exciting yeah. is that? Yeah, so that's the first time that he and I have, have gone on tour together. Yeah. That's um, you, and what's he thirteen? This is stepping into manhood because it it's that. Um, yeah. Where are the the rituals and traditions around that in our you know modern world? I and mean, they're not really, are they? So he will. Well, bring, they you know, are. If, I mean, we have to look for them, but they are there. But uh, actually, even in the, in the, the world that you know, in this kind of the world of New Zealand, shall we say, mm -hmm. you know, in New Zealand, there are. Uh, Many people that are now part, bringing their children, their boys and their girls, to be put through a rites of passage ceremony, which happens here in Golden Bay. And uh, I've been involved in the in the one for initiating the young boys, which is called Tracks. The one for girls is called Tides. And um, young girls and boys are coming from all over New Zealand with their parents uh, to go through this initiation, this rites of passage. I love it. It's incredible. That. And they are, they are happening in Britain and they're happening in, in America. So, so we are reclaiming that right. Yes. Yeah. Can you share any of what, what happens in the ritual? Uh, there's, um, there are various, various kind of challenges um, for, and those are varied and slightly changed for each person and their particular needs. Um, and then gradually it leads to um, a purification and then a, like a chosen cutting of ties and a, and a um, like a, a departure from being a child to and a welcoming to being an adult. And then when they are met at the end by their respective other parent, mm -hmm. um, then they are uh, pre-warmed up to the idea that they have to see their child, I mean, as an adult now. 
they have to see them with new eyes and not assume that they know them because they've because they've changed they're different that is such a key point, isn't it? I remember when my lad was growing up, that whole teenage years, I felt, I really felt for him. I mean, he see, sees his dad regularly, but it was something about there's only so much I as a mother can do. And also, you know, to have a different relationship with him as he became a man, you know, and I can't refer to him as my boy anymore. So I call him my lad, <laughs> though, because yeah, he's, yeah. he's his own lad. Yeah. A musician yeah. himself, the lovely Louis. Um, yeah. But, I mean, you know, you're right. We have we see them from being tiny littles and you know, we have to change our relationship with them as well. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. And actually don't we have to do that every day anyway with everyone that we see really oh. and including with ourselves. Like we wake up in the morning and see ourselves for the first time and go, God, this is a new day. I'm not actually many of the things that I was yesterday. You know, that's a nice perspective to play with. Thank you. You're right. <laughs> yeah. And if we are practicing that in our lives anyway, then of course it's going to wear off on our children. It's not like we have to actually really think about it because it's just what's happening, isn't it? You know, oh, hey, how are you going, son? You know, <laughs> what's up, man? <laughs> Every time you go to sleep at night, it's a rebirth and a renewal because you're actually diving into the subconscious again, back to spirit for however many hours. And every yeah. time you come into a new day, there's a new dawn, a new, what's new yeah. dawn there somewhere? Yeah, totally. A new opportunity to, you know, thank you, thank you. <laughs> absolutely yeah. absolutely so bringing your son on tour is going to be yeah. amazing for both of you you know you're going to really that whole connection between the two of you does, does, does he play is he in, interested in the sounds uh he's not playing um for other people should we put it that way no, but no, i know himself. does he enjoy he's, uh, he's an incredible pianist and composes his own songs and um, he's got an incredible sense of rhythm. But, uh, and he's actually really quite interested in recording in GarageBand, but all of that is done in the privacy of his own world. <laughs> of, course, of course, but it's coming through, you know, it's coming through yeah. <clears throat> in his way, like yeah. my lads comes through in his way, you know, it's them. Oh, it's, yeah. Because really, ultimately, you know, you could be making a cake, that might be your creative outlet, you know. Yeah. Or, or, as many of you know, in fact, I often use that as a, um, a suggestion to implant that into people's minds that when they come to my sound journeys and concerts, they could bring a sugar free cake with them. That's a nice idea. Um, 16th of August, Bournemouth, for instance, that would be quite nice. <laughs> you, you know, free, sugar free. Ask cake. and thou shalt receive, you know. Yes. <laughs> share and share alike. Or in. I know you're going to uh, make a drag. Probably sugar free though, because we're the sugar free tribe. Yeah, ab absolutely. I know that Julie would like that too. Make a drag. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Claire Cortell living now down in, um, in Devon. <clears throat> and of course, Debbie Walker over in Cornwall. You've got a lot of fans in this country, a lot of people that are really, really value what you're doing and what you're bringing through. So I thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of that and also i know you've made a good connection with them um, with shane over in australia too yeah, shane. And that he's whole, a good guy the support yeah. that he wants to give you with your music so that your music can get out there and can earn you the revenue that you deserve to have and i think that you know going through the old itunes and spotify and all that isn't necessarily the best way to do it um so i know that he is creating a new platform to be able to get your music out there so i think yeah the work that shane is doing is really really valuable and he's he's putting such an incredible amount of energy into supporting alternative spiritual open-minded open-hearted music you know conscious music yes out there in the world streaming it it's just amazing like really i can't emphasize enough how good that that is I know. <laughs> you you lovely brothers you and shane oh it's Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could have another interview about that, couldn't we? Well, I, I know that, he, that he, wanted, that he, wanted, he wanted to talk to you about some of the issues that come up in that um, because it was so honest. And I don't know if that's for something for you and him to do at some stage or, uh, you know. Yeah, I was actually, I think I even actually suggested that that would be something to have a discussion about. And, and I actually really do like having and watching discussions between people that are, you know, on the TV, being incredibly natural, having a conversation together, kind of like what we're doing, really, you know, like I just, 
much rather watch and listen to that. Yes. See people being really honest about things. You know, it's like, okay, I'm I'm seeker. I've got all these things that I've achieved and things that I've done, and you know, more and more people know of what I'm doing and my music and all of that. But on the other hand, I'm still seeker who sometimes struggles with the shit that we all struggle with, you know, and has moments when I'm like, what on earth am I doing? You know, and, you know, downtime and how we're all kind of learning how to deal with that, you know, those melancholy moments or maybe even stronger than that. You know? mm. How we're learning to, to not feed that, but watch it and become more emotionally intelligent and support each other at times when we need it. And, Absolutely. You know, to know that actually we're not freaks because we've got this really bad thing going on or anything. It's actually what everyone's got going on, you know. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. Everybody's got actually, it's, it's far worse trying to hold on than it is to actually just let go and surrender and, and break down and then come back together again, you know. That's right. It's sharing <clears> that <throat> vulnerability of truth, of the humanity within us that connects us more as well. And you know, that ability to also ask for help, you know, not expecting to do everything by yourself. You, you, what is that about? Is that so wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really. So I can't remember how I got onto that subject. but Yeah, that you were going to have a chat with Shane about things like that, but um, you've alluded oh, to... Oh, yeah, that's right. Bro conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so if you've got a piece of um, advice for people right here and now... Yeah. What would that be, Seeker, here on Sheeta? Uh, that would be to um, hug everyone more. <laughs> <laughs> and actually what I was particularly got immediately when you asked that, in all honesty, was listen to the teenagers more and hug them. Yeah. Yeah, our youth, you know. Yeah, you know, we're in the middle age of it all now. Um, but well, because, you know, if we like, think that we're having trouble dealing with melancholy, imagine not having, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, we're pretty lucky, let's put it that way, you know. We're pretty blessed. And there's a lot of stuff out there that is hard for everyone, especially the youngsters. And they've got so much to offer us. So yeah. let's uh, get those diamonds and polish them up, feed them up, Be, share with them. Yeah, having time with the teenagers. Yeah. Uh, Miguel Dean is another um, a chap that's come through Chi Time. He's been part of Conscious Living Events too, does a lot of work with, with the youth. I know he'll find this yeah. conversation really interesting. Um, yeah. Be able to um, really relate to teenagers. And even my, my lad has, has talked to me about some of the difficulties, you know, that the perspective that they've had being brought up with all the gizmos and gadgets and the state of the world and that sort of feeling of like, well, what on earth are we going to do? And then we hear that, you know, the Paris climate treaty thing is being, but anyway, I haven't, let's not go down too much of that, that yeah. path right now, but to, as you say, to hug and to be with the teenagers and the young adults, and to show yeah. them why there's another guy, Rob Greenfield, I don't know if you've heard about him, he's an yeah. eco adventurer, yeah. And yeah. he did an incredible talk down in, in Totnes. And there was, um, there was the teenagers yeah. there and the, the grandparents and he connected everybody through realizing mm. that you can make a difference. You can still make a change with every little choice that you make. And when you work that together with the in integrity of, of the earth and the ancestors, yeah. yes. you know, to, to yeah. know that it was still possible. Totally. Yeah, I'm right with you. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess like we were saying earlier, you know, bring it into every day, every moment situations, you know. That's all we can yeah. do. And, and create the communities that we want, not try and um, square peg round hole into these dysfunctional so-called... Oh, it's pretty radical though, isn't it? I mean, for us, you know, having been so many years doing things in a certain mind state, because what we're talking about here is a state of mind, you know, like these external things are relatively easy to watch what we're doing and realize it and say, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do this instead, you know, make a conscious choice, but it's the things that are more subtly embedded and grained into us as uh, behavioral patterns that we have to raise up to awareness, bring those to the surface in us and say, Oh my God, you know, look how limited I've been. And 
for me, the fast track to realize that in the first place is to look at the young people because they haven't got that and then go, okay, what have they got that I am not doing? Oh my God, they're bouncing around, they're dancing, they're, you know, they're learning about, they're not behaving with all the rules and the laws of society and the structures and things that we're supposed to do. They're actually breaking those rules, partly because they don't even know them because it takes years to learn them all. Like, who the hell taught us this, like, this rule book? You know, at what point did we say, hang on a minute, I'm going to read the rule book and I'm going to read it for 50 years until I know every single little bylaw and everything that I'm supposed to behave like. You turn to the teenagers and the kids who haven't been taught that because we did a really grand job of rebelling to all of that and saying, get lost, we're not having it, paving the way for them to come along and not have it. So now we need to turn around and look at them and go, what the hell is living on planet Earth all about if we take away all those stupid rules? The kids are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. The rules of the heart being run from your heart being your barometer for everything. You know? Yeah. Oh, and empathy. So maybe out of this, out of this, out of this <laughs> interview, people were going to realize that actually uh, underneath this quiet persona, I'm in fact a radical anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very quiet anarchist. <laughs> You're not quiet at all. You play a very loud instrument. <laughs> which rocks this world. And I think when you have that kind of sound therapy running through your cells, it reprograms you, or it certainly dislodges a lot of the rubbish. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm dislodging people. Excuse me, sir. What's your job? I'm a professional dislodger. (laughs) (laughs) David Bowie creeping in. The... um, (laughs) chat with you for hours let's do it again another time but um yeah, okay. <laughs> now it'd be good to say thank you so much to Seeker for being part of Chi Time and for yeah. sharing thank you Clara it's been awesome really has thanks everyone for listening and I uh, hope to catch up with you this summer in the UK yeah and if you want start to Stonehenge down. yeah have a look on my website actually seekermusic.com thank you that's Seeker and, spelled uh, S-I-K-A just in case, even though I was going to talk yeah. to you about being a seeker, but I'm sure people have mentioned that to you before. If you are a oh, seeker... No, I've heard that before. That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we are going to leave you with the consciousness shift from the new album, Seven Rings, with Seeker and Phil Thornton. So keep, you, yeah. keep your chi up, my friend. Thank you so much for listening. And see you at a seeker gig over the summer. Not at Stonehenge, though, because it's sold out.